25 years after the console's release, the Nintendo 64 still has a strong following, and new gamers are discovering it every year. If you're just discovering the console for the first time, or if you haven't plugged one in since you were a kid, getting it working on modern TVs can be confusing, and there's a lot of stuff you have to worry about that just doesn't exist with modern HDMI consoles. This video will show you how to connect your N64 to a modern TV, as well as go over some tips and show some new hardware that's been released that might benefit your setup. So sit back and let's jump in. Before we get into the video, I just want to skip to the end and say if you already own an N64 and want an easy way to get started, simply grab any CRT you could find that still works, connect the yellow cable it came with, and start playing your cartridges. It's easy to get caught up in fancy mods and accessories, so I just wanted to politely remind everyone that playing it the same way you might have a quarter decade ago is still awesome. There's also services like Nintendo's Switch Online that let you play the games on modern hardware, and there's even ways to emulate them in high definition. If you're just looking to try some N64 games, you might want to look into those other options, but this video is going to focus on original hardware only. Also, while the main focus of this video is getting it connected to your TV in the best way possible for your setup, I also want to highlight some tips and newer accessories as well. These are projects we've been following on RetroRGB.com, and if you're not subscribed to the podcast or website, you might not have heard of them. Or maybe you have, but I feel like it's important to talk about them here. So, let's get started. Alright, let's start out with an easy one that will affect anyone using an N64. Underneath the console's plastic door is the jumper pack, and if this isn't plugged in, or if it's come loose, the console won't boot at all. And I've seen lots of times that people thought their N64 was broken, but that just needed to be reseated. Use a soft piece of plastic, or very carefully use the door to pry the original out, put it back in, and see if that works to fix it. Also, Nintendo made an accessory called the Expansion Pack that replaces the jumper and doubles the internal RAM from 4 megabytes to 8 megabytes. Most of the library will play exactly the same regardless of which is used, and only a few games actually require it. The most common feature the expansion pack unlocks are higher resolution modes, but sometimes those modes are interlaced resolutions, which aren't the best to use on modern TVs, in most scenarios. If your N64 still has the original jumper pack, I wouldn't worry too much about hunting one down, unless you specifically want to play some of the games that benefit from it. If you do decide to use one, just make sure you're using an official Nintendo one with the red top and Nintendo logo. Now, I'm sure some third-party ones are fine, and I think there were even a few officially licensed by Nintendo and use their chips, but it's up to you if you want to take the chance. I've seen low-quality third-party ones cause games to crash, and ROM carts might not even boot at all with them. And if you want more info on what the extra memory does to games that do support it, check out this video from Stop Skeletons From Fighting. Now onto memory cards, or as Nintendo calls it, the controller pack. Many games require this to save, and while I'm sure a lot of the original N64 controller packs are still working, after 25 years, their time is probably limited, and at the very least, the battery will need replacing. While there's mods available to upgrade or fix original memory packs, and plenty of junky third-party solutions, there's one new high-quality option available, the Forever Pack 64. These come in injection molded cases to match your console's plastic, and contain modern technology that doesn't rely on a battery to contain your saves. Since the N64 can only address a limited amount of save data at a time, the Forever Pack doesn't offer any more storage than the original, but that would be the case with any replacement memory pack. It's a bit more expensive than ones you'd find on eBay or Amazon, but at $30 I'd still call it an inexpensive solution that's much higher quality than most of the alternatives. Tito from Macho Nacho Productions recently did an in-depth video about them, which has all the details you'd need to know about it. I highly recommend watching. Here's another easy tip I thought was worth mentioning. If you want to play Japanese games on North American consoles, or vice versa, they won't fit. Nintendo produced slightly different cartridges for those markets, I guess as a way to try and prevent games from being imported. My favorite way around this is to replace the original cartridge tray with a universal 3D printed one that Greg from LaserBear designed. 
He sells them in multiple colors to match the consoles, and he even provided the files for people to print their own. Now, this won't magically allow you to play 50Hz European PAL games on US consoles, but you could at least swap between US and Japanese games. While sure, you could probably just cut the original trays, I really don't like cutting plastic on original consoles. If you're looking for different ways to load games on original consoles, there's devices called ROM carts available for most consoles out there that let you put games on a micro SD card and launch them exactly as if it were the original cartridge. My favorite is the EverDrive 64X5 from Crix. It's just over $100 and plays pretty much the whole library of N64 games and homebrew. The only disadvantage to the X5 is you have to hold reset and go back to the menu to make sure your save games write to the micro SD card. Crix also offers a higher end X7 version that doesn't require a reset to save, as well as offers developer features and a real time clock to use with games like Animal Crossing. Using a ROM cart isn't just about being able to leave your original cartridges on a shelf. There is an entire scene of developers who edit N64 games to have new features, as well as translate Japanese-only games to English. You can even patch games with cheat codes and try things like software deblur tweaking to sharpen up some games. I could probably do a video just on N64 ROM patches, but for now I'll say this. Unless you already own every N64 game you'll ever play and have no interest in patches, at least consider getting a ROM cart. All of my game collector friends still scour game stores for their favorite carts, but usually end up just playing on the ROM cart, both for convenience and to make sure that those very rare and expensive carts they bought stay safely on their shelves. One last accessory I'd like to talk about are the controllers, because even if you prefer the originals, you might need an analog stick replacement, or if you're one of the people that doesn't like the Trident controller at all, you might want to look into different, newer third-party options. Here's the problem though, everyone's hands are different, so giving controller recommendations really aren't the easiest thing to do, and I'm not an N64 controller expert anyway. What I would suggest is that you try to find a reviewer that loves the N64 Shimmering. that plays the same exact type of games that you want to play, because I imagine somebody that plays Goldeneye might not want the exact same things as somebody who plays something like Super Smash Bros. Overall though, if you do decide to get one of the newer wireless controllers, there is one recommendation that I could definitely give. Look into 3D printed braces that prevent the receiver from sagging. Todd from Retrofrog designed some brackets to hold them in place, which you can purchase or just print yourself for free if you have a 3D printer. It's weird we need to worry about this at all though. I mean, how did multiple companies make receivers without strain relief that could put a lot of pressure on the controller ports? Maybe you don't need the braces, but for $7, or free if you could print your own, why take the chance? Sorry I couldn't be more help with this one, but like I said before, I'm not an N64 controller expert, and I would much rather just be honest about that than try to fake it through my own review and recommend something that isn't the best fit for your needs. There's plenty of other people out there that do excellent N64 related reviews though, so please give those a look and see if you could find one that solves whatever solution you need. Okay, now on to the main focus of this video, how to play N64 consoles on modern displays. I gotta start out by repeating what I said at the beginning though. Just grabbing any old CRT and connecting the composite video cables is an excellent way to experience N64 games. I think game devs figured out how to use the blurriness of composite video to blend the low resolution 3D graphics, and as a result, I truly think any CRT experience is great. Composite on a small consumer grade TV takes advantage of the blending and looks pretty awesome. And you know, so does RGB on a professional grade monitor. Basically, if you have any working CRT, you've got all you need. Now, I totally understand that most people watching won't want to deal with the hassle of CRTs and probably already have a really nice flat panel they want to use. But unlike CRTs, it's not as easy as just plugging in the cables that came with your N64. First, even if your modern TV still offers analog inputs, it'll be really laggy and the video will be processed wrong. I've demonstrated why this happens in a few other videos, but for now I'll skip to the end and strongly recommend not connecting your N64 directly to any flat panel. As a result, you'll need to use a scaler to get the signal into a flat panel's HDMI input. Some excellent entry level options that scale to 480p are the Rad 2X and RetroTank Mini each designed by creator Mike Chi, and performed pretty much identically. 
The RAD 2X simply plugs into the N64's multi-out and outputs HDMI. It'll automatically detect if you've done an RGB mod, more on that in a second, but it'll still work with all N64 consoles. Overall, you couldn't possibly find an easier solution. The RetroTank Mini requires a cable and power, so it's not as streamlined a solution, but it has the advantage of working with any console that outputs composite or S-video. And you could just power it for most TVs USB ports, so it won't even take up a wall plug. If you don't mind spending some extra money, the RetroTank 5X can output much higher resolutions and offers a ton of features. Now, to be clear, you don't need to spend more money on a fancy scaler for a good N64 experience, but if your TV does a bad job scaling 480p, upgrading to the RetroTank 5X will make a big difference. It even supports higher quality signals like RGB and offers a ton of video options. While there's always talk of new scalers, the RetroTank 5X is currently the best plug-and-play scaler on the market and should be a safe investment, even with the stuff that's scheduled to come next. Before we go any further, we have to talk about video signals just for a moment. See, the Nintendo 64 only outputs composite video on every single console shipped, and while all NTSC consoles can output S-Video, some PAL consoles are composite only. There's nothing wrong with using composite video, but if S-Video is available on your console and TV or scaler, buying a quality S-Video cable will get you more sharpness and the colors will be more defined. Now, on the flip side, buying a cheap, unshielded S-Video cable will probably be worse overall than using composite video, so please check the links on RetroRGB to make sure you get a good one. If you're a sharpness enthusiast, you can go one step further and install an internal modification that gets you RGB output. The difference from S-Video to RGB isn't that big, but if you're looking to play on a high-end scaler or something like a broadcast monitor, you might prefer the look. Some older N64s only require a pretty easy mod, and the boards are more affordable too. I prefer the ones from Voltar and Bordy, and while there's others out there, some are terrible, so please be careful which one you buy. As a side note, I'd definitely say the easy RGB mod is worth doing if you own an open source scan converter, as that scaler doesn't accept composite or S-video, and doing the easy RGB mod is actually cheaper than a converter. Now, if the motherboard in your N64 isn't compatible with the basic RGB mod, just check RetroRGB.com for more info on how to tell, there is another RGB mod available, but it's really complicated to install. If you don't have the experience or the right tools, definitely do not try this yourself. It might still be worth the effort, though, if every other console in your setup is RGB or component. Doing an RGB mod would simply keep all of your cables the same, so you could route them all through one switch, and get a small boost in quality. If getting the best quality from your N64 is your end goal, and your target display or monitor has an HDMI input, I'd strongly suggest skipping the RGB mod altogether and go directly to a digital-to-digital -digital HDMI mod because they're about the same level of difficulty anyway. Let's check out two that are available now. The first of the two HDMI kits is called the Ultra HDMI and was released a few years ago. It's a great option that offers excellent quality output, but they're almost impossible to get. If you already own one, rest assured that it's a great device, but if you're looking to upgrade today, there's a new HDMI kit that's definitely a step up. The latest Nintendo 64 HDMI kit to be released is called the N64 Digital, and it offers a bunch of cool features. I recently did a live stream with the team that made it, and we went over all the little details, but I still want to show the basics of it here. The first time you connect an N64 Digital to your TV, enter the menu by hitting L trigger plus right trigger plus D-pad right plus C right. Now you'll want to get into the video settings and set your resolution to match your display. If you're using a 4K TV or any display higher than 1200p, try the 1200p mode and give it a moment. If it works, cool. If not, just back down to 1080p and you'll be fine. Depending on your TV or monitor, you may want to enter the advanced video menu and try different frame lock modes. I was able to use the lowest lag setting on a very sensitive TV, and I never once dropped signal. I'd start with the lowest lag mode, and if you don't have any problems, just leave it and never think about it again. There's even some analog video output options too, as the N64D adds RGB and component video as well, directly through the multi-out. 
Now, those settings only need to be set once, and you could pretty much forget about them afterwards, but one setting you'll probably use all the time is the N64D's custom zoom feature. Luckily, because of how the N64 Digital scales the video, there's no concern about integer scaling. Just set it to fill the screen. Every game is different though, so you'll want to tweak this with each one to get the most out of your display. You could even safely zoom a bit farther if you'd like, as N64 game developers would take CRT overscan into account and didn't put any important information near the edges of the screen. I have a whole other video dedicated to this, and always use my scalers in 5x mode for this reason. Check that out if you're interested. One cool bonus is EverDrive 64 users on the latest firmware will have these settings saved per game, so you'll be able to set it once, and the N64 Digital will remember each time you load that game again. People using original cartridges or other ROM carts will still have to do it manually, but honestly it's a really quick and easy process that's worth getting used to. One cool option the N64 Digital offers, as well as the RetroTank and Rad2x products, is a smoothing filter. Now, you might be wondering why I'm talking about smoothing out an image when so many retro gamers put so much effort into sharpening the image. Well, to demonstrate, let's connect the N64 Digital to both a CRT and flat panel at the same time. With smoothing off, the digital screen looks awesome, but those low resolution graphics really stand out. Now, check out what happens when I turn on the N64 Digital smoothing. While it doesn't magically render the video in HD, I think the smoothing filter really provides a look that's closer to a CRT, the original intended look, all while retaining the advantages of a flat panel. The RetroTINKS filters are good as well. One thing to note about the Tink 2X line of products, which include the Rad 2X, is the final look will totally depend on how your TV scales 480p. Some TVs just do a better job scaling lower resolutions, but others won't look as good as you see here in the bottom left. Price doesn't seem to be a factor either. I have a $250 TV that scales 480p beautifully, but I've seen very expensive monitors do a much worse job. I really think if you're on a budget, it's worth taking the risk though, as all the Tink 2Xs are great zero lag devices. Now, because this is YouTube and I'll get trolled if I don't, I'm forced to test the M cable. And as usual, it does almost nothing, regardless of what resolution the N64 HDMI solution is set to. While I have seen the M Classic work well for original Xbox, as well as 720p native games, it's just not something that works well in any mode with pre 6th generation video games, and that's the same when the M cable is connected to any other method of converting the N64 or other classic consoles to HDMI. Now, if you turn on the N64D smoothing filter and try to use the M cable, I guess it makes a difference? Definitely do not buy the M cable just to use with the N64, but if you already have one, try setting the console or scaler's output to different resolutions and see what looks best on your TV. Both the RetroTINK 5X and N64 Digital have one more feature I strongly recommend checking out, CRT Scanline Emulation. I need to be clear that these are not the basic horizontal black lines we've previously seen advertised as scan lines. These are a much more accurate representation of the different types of CRT screens you'd see. Now, scan lines never look good in these videos due to compression, so please don't judge them based on what you see here. You'll really need to see it for yourself, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised, but I'll still show one example here. Check out F-Zero from the N64D without any extra features turned on. The game looks kinda messy next to a CRT, as you can really see how developers use the way a CRT works to blend the images. Now we'll turn on the smoothing filter. Better, but not perfect. But if we also turn on a slot mask scanline filter with boost on to compensate for brightness, it's not bad. It's not exactly like you'd find on a CRT, but in my opinion, it really helps the look. Now, if you grew up in the flat panel era and never really used CRTs, I imagine this might all look like a big mess to your eyes, and that's totally fine. But if you do have experience with CRTs, these filters provide a really accurate look that could be something you'd be interested in. One last thing to mention about the internal HDMI mods is they require that you cut the plastic of the console. I really hate doing this because eventually some other mod will be released rendering that wholly useless ruining the look of the console. 
Luckily, Greg from LaserBear has us covered again. Greg designed a kit that allows you to install the HDMI port without cutting any plastic on your console by replacing the original rear multi-out cover with a new one. You could put the original aside, maybe keep it next to the old cartridge tray, and save it in case you ever change the mod. Adding the no-cut kit does make it hard to connect both an HDMI and analog cable at the same time, but LaserBear has another solution for that, an HDMI extender that converts the output to a standard-sized HDMI jack with a pass-through port for analog cables. And since the N64D also adds RGB output to your N64, this kit will allow dual RGB and HDMI output with no plastic or cable cutting required. I'm a huge fan of preserving original plastic when possible, so please seriously consider this if you decide to install the N64D. Heck, even the HDMI size conversion makes it worth it, in my opinion. So hopefully this brings everybody up to speed on how to get started playing N64 today. There's of course countless of other accessories and mods that you could do that I didn't touch upon because I really wanted to keep this more of a general basic video, but hopefully you at least got all the tips that you need to get started. If you're still on the fence about what video and audio output solution is best for you, I would suggest thinking about it as a total solution. So it's really easy to say one of the HDMI mods, especially the N64 Digital, is the best you can get out of your N64, but is that really the best for your setup? Do you already have a bunch of other consoles connected through a scaler one way? Is the N64 one of your favorite consoles or one that you like a lot and are completely happy with how you're playing now? I would always take the entire setup and of course budget into consideration whenever you're thinking about these things if you want to upgrade or not. If you want more info, please check out all the posts on RetroRGB.com as we try and highlight all the cool new stuff constantly being released. Also, please check out the weekly podcast that keeps everyone in the loop of new products and updates in the retro gaming scene. It's available as a video and everywhere audio podcasts are found. Well, that's it for this time. As always, I want to give a special thank you to everyone who subscribes on Patreon and Floatplane, as your support is keeping the website, videos, and research alive. For more info on how to support, please check out the links in the description and the website. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.